and um, a number of cats are owned uh, by households across Europe, but also dogs. And the market, I suppose, is estimated to be worth about 16 billion euro here in Europe alone. And there are about 8.5 million tonnes of pet food sold annually. So it's a, it's a competitive but also a lucrative market. Now, in terms of the pelagic uh, process waters or refrigerated sea waters, um, Killy Beggs is the largest processor of pelagic fish in Ireland, and it's estimated that th this sector is worth about 55 million euro to processors in this region. Um, I've just given a value on the metric tons of pelagic fish landed annually there. Now that obviously has changed in recent times. And I should state that this project was carried out in 2019, 2020. But when fish are processed, be they blue whiting or mackerel or herring or scad, um, or any fish for that matter, there is a certain amount of byproduct or co-product uh, is what we really should call it if we want to use it later, that is generated. And blood is a significant fraction of the co-product that's produced during processing. Now, this co-product is, is an environmental concern for processors, but it's also costly for them to, um, to clean up before uh, waters are released back into the ocean. If we take a, a similar industry, the meat process sector um, here in Ireland and the beef sector, uh, the blood that is generated during slaughter and processing of meat is utilised. For example, it's used for black pudding, but it's also utilised for other, other functions such as use in animal feeds um, here in Ireland. So we were thinking with this project, could we do the same with fish blood waters? Our idea was to generate and to look at the, the proteins that were recovered, the food bioactives or the health beneficial ingredients that were recovered, and then to tie in with the concepts of blue growth and sustainability while we were at it. And the project, I suppose, was underpinned by what we like to call expertise, and hopefully you'll think the same in this area in terms of recovery and utilisation of, of this resource, really. Now, um, the target is pet foods, but within that sector and even within the human food sector, uh, different food ingredients or feed ingredients have different values. And amino acids are quite a valuable resource. Um, in the US pet food ingredients market, for example, amino acids make up a significant share of the, the kilotons of products that are produced annually. And, um, you know, amino acids are essential for humans, but they're also essential for pets. Um, Along with this, the blood waters also contain a significant amount of lipids such as EPA and DHA, and these have different health benefits for pets as well. So what we did was basically look at the resource, we went to a number of processors, and we, we not harvested, but we obtained different samples from different parts of process lines and factories. And um, we, you know, we characterized the blood waters first because we needed to know what we were working with. So our methodology was basically to recover the blood water samples, to stabilize them after we recover them, and then to analyze them for different protein, ash, lipid, free and total amino acid contents, and protein content and peptide content. And this is a schematic, I suppose, of what we actually did in the project. We then, following our, our schematic in the lab, we tried to upscale it to what we like to call pilot scale, but really was very small pilot scale. Um, and this involved basically fractionation of the blood waters, stabilization of the blood waters, and then characterization of what resulted from our fractionation processes for bioactives. And you can see here on the bottom left hand corner, as you look at your screen, an example of um, the permeate and the retentate or the, the protein fractions that were recovered uh, following our fractionation process. So we then try to characterize these uh, fractions and we looked at their potential health benefits for a pet. So in pets, especially dogs, um, heart health um, and maintenance of heart health and prevention of high blood pressure is a significant issue. And it can have knock on effects for, uh, in relation to inflammation and other um, problems that pets face. So we basically looked at characterizing the um, ability of our blood water fractions to inhibit an enzyme known as ACE or angiotensin converting enzyme one. Um, we wanted to inhibit this enzyme because this enzyme basically causes high blood pressure. And if we can inhibit it, we can maintain normal tensile blood pressure. 
Now, heart health issues is a significant problem in elderly dogs. So we also um, characterize the effect of these blood waters alone and in a product um, in elderly dogs in an animal trial. We also looked at the techno-functional um, or the ease of use um, aspects of the product. Um, and we looked at solubility of our recovered blue whiting and mackerel blood waters um, and the different fractions that we obtained from our fractionation process with regards to those. So yeah, so this is just a, an overview of what we did. We basically took our recovered blood waters. We obviously assessed them for um, microbial content as well and the safety of what we recovered. And we combined uh, different percentages of, of these blood waters into uh, pet treat products. So we came up with a recipe as well to develop different pet treats. Okay. Um, so that was what we did with the blood waters. And I'll, I'll speak a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, in relation to the fish bowl project, we looked at headed and gutted material generated from a different pelagic species. Okay, and I, I just show here um, rough amounts because the amounts of fish that are landed is obviously very important in terms of the sustainability of any process and the volume of any co-product ingredient you can generate. And as I always say, if you don't have the fish, you can't really do anything. But uh, based on past landings, and hopefully in the future, there will be more landings in Killybags and other ports, um, you know, uh, you can calculate the amount of raw material in terms of skins from, for example, head and gut material that is available to you to work with. And then following your process, you can determine the quantity of product that you will produce as well. So this is an example of some of the headed and gutted blue whiting um, meal skin and bones that we obtained from BIM and one of the companies that we worked with up in uh, Killy Bakes. And we received this in the form of a frozen block. It was about four kgs in weight. Um, our aim here was to develop a, a fish protein hydrolysis from this byproduct. So what is a fish protein hydrolysis or FPH as it's abbreviated to quite regularly. So a fish protein hydrolysis basically is a protein that's broken down um, into amino acids or peptides. These peptides are between two and 30 amino acids in length, and they can have a health benefit that goes above and beyond basic human nutrition for the consumer. These hydrolysis can be generated using different enzymes or chemicals, or there's also some autolysis process that can naturally produce um, fish protein hydrolysis using lactic acid bacteria that are existing on the skin of fish, but you have a less stable product if it's an autolysis um, process. Fish protein hydrolysis, the market value of them is, is growing or, or the market use of them is growing. We use them in human nutrition from the dairy industry regularly, and um, they're also used um, in the poultry and fish feed sectors and livestock sectors as well. So we developed different methods to extract um, our, our proteins and to generate our hydrolysis from, from this headed and gutted material. Um, here I just give it an overview of the, I suppose, the, the types of products that are the, the types of forms, I should say, that fish protein hydrolysis can come in. You can dry them to a, a very fine powder. Uh, that's a more expensive process than just generating a liquid or paste product um, from your, your fish waste. And um, like pelagic fisheries are the only areas from which fish protein hydrolysis are generated. They are, as you can see from this table, produced from a lot of fish species currently globally. So again, we made some pet treats <laughs> uh, with our fish protein hydrolysis. And this is just an outline of, of and some images, I suppose, of, of the process that we used. Again, this was at lab scale, but it was quite, quite an, a nice project to work on. And then we also looked at uh, the end products versus controls where we use dairy hydrolysis in, in um, our biscuit formulation. Um, and we measured the shelf life of our products um, as well. And we looked at added health benefits such as the ability of our products to inhibit the enzyme ACE1 or angiotensin converting enzyme 1 in vitro. And this is basically uh, an indicator if you can inhibit it for antihypertensive effects. We, as I mentioned, we also carried out a dog trial with this product where we fed elderly dogs um, 
elderly dogs are defined as dogs over 13 years of age. Um, they are a group of pets that are susceptible to high blood pressure. So that's why they were selected. And we fed these 10 dogs uh, over two weeks with our positive control and our test biscuit, which we had found in the lab to be able to reduce ACE1 inhibitory activity. And the active ingredient in that was our, our fish protein hydrolysis developed from pelagic headed and gut material. So in, in the animal trial, we used the blood pressure measurement um, known as the tail cutoff method. And this is performed by vets. And it's important that it is performed by vets because when you're dealing with companion animals, there is a lot of negative association with the use of caged animals. So it's better to, to go to vets and to use uh, their clients uh, to trial different products if you're marketing that product at the end. And we also assess the palatability and digestibility of, of the, the product versus controls. Now, uh, we actually have a patent on this project and, and that's the patent there. And uh, there is a value proposition there for the know-how if companies are interested in taking it up. I should state that just in this table that I show here that um, in the pet feed sector, the legislation regarding getting a product to market, it's not as stringent as the human um, area in terms of health foods, um, but there are certain criteria that you have to comply with to make any health claim. So I just give an example here of the different types of tests that you need to do to make um, different types of claims. And then the third project I'd like to talk about is our muscle production and coal products project or the muscle project. Um, so this basically involved looking at rope grown muscles um, at different uh, grower sites on the west coast of Ireland. Um, there is an issue with rope grown mussels in terms of the, um, the species that and the quantity of, of mussels that are basically underutilized and discarded as byproduct or, or waste, or as we would like to call it, co product in this case. Um, we produce around, there's around 200 million tons of mussels produced annually. They're known as an excellent source of protein, um, but there is a large amount of waste. Now, this waste also is rich in protein in different lipids, um, and we want to look at, at the waste product or the coal product produced by our growers on the West Coast and to see if we could do anything with that. So just different types of byproduct or coal product include seed muscle, I suppose, that doesn't mature. Um, muscles that have broken shells and aren't aesthetically suitable for sale. Um, barnacle fine muscles, and then you also have the, the bice th threads that um, is a waste product as well, or byproduct. So some of the key findings from this um, project were that the season and byproduct type um, resulted in a difference in the meat yields and proximal composition um, and hydrolysis yields that we could generate from the muscle byproducts. Um, these hydrolysis also had ACE inhibitor activity with low IC50 values. Um, they were an excellent source of essential and non-essential amino acids. They, we think, are an excellent um, idea in terms of their applicability based on their solubility. Um, and when you generate a hydrolysis, um, as shown in, in the methodology uh, diagram I have up here, uh, you also generate clean shells. And these clean shells have, have an added value as well. So current uses for shells, for example, include uh, their use in wastewater treatment. They're used in hardscapes and in concrete, uh, concrete aggregate production. They're used in human and pet supplements as well. Um, so they have a multitude of applications. And in terms of the clean shell, I suppose one of the potential interesting applications is their use as a source of calcium uh, for feed use in the chicken um, and poultry sector to uh, strengthen chicken shell, for example. The final project I suppose I'm just going to touch on is um, the MISO project. So as I mentioned at the start, the MISO project is looking at utilization of different mesopelagic species. And I, I just give some examples of what these species look like um, and whether we can harvest them sustainably um, and use th them as a source of protein and different feed and food ingredients. So at the moment, we're just this project is ongoing and we're looking at um, 
mesopelagic species known as pearl sides and blue whiting, which have been collected in the WESPA survey by the Marine Institute. Um, our colleagues in Nofema, and we had a speaker on last week from Nofema, um, our colleague there is looking at the development of silage, hydrolysis, and liquid and aqueous extracts. And we, we are then here in Chagas characterizing these extracts in terms of their potential health beneficial ingredients. So to sum up, I suppose, all of the projects, <laughs> um, some challenges that people interested in adding value to co-products are or byproducts products face really relate to firstly the selection of the fish. <laughs> okay, so if you're trying to make a hydrolysis product, it's very important that the protein content of, of your fish to start with is, is quite good. Um, things like the lipid content and dash also can have an impact on what you can market and what type of products you can develop. Then once you have selected your fish species, you have to decide on the process and what you're going to do to that cool product to generate it into something with value that hopefully you can sell. So uh, different processes you can employ are like grinding, milling, hydrolysis, as I mentioned. Um, then you have to decide whether your hydrolysis process is a batch or continuous process. You have to select your enzymes. And there's a multitude of things there really that you have to get right to produce the right product. And then in terms of stabilization of your product, you have to basically decide how you're going to clean up your product, remove things like odors um, and bitter taste, for example, can be an issue and how you're going to stabilize your product. So what kind of drying methodology are you going to use? And of course, the economics of all of this is very important as well. You have to be able to produce your product for less than you can sell it for. Other challenges include things like the cost associated with um, establishing a plant to, to do this. Um, if it's a food grade or a feed grade facility, you have to comply with different legislation there and rules. Um, you also have to consider the site and location of your processing plant because that's going to have an impact on costs um, and the environment as well. You have to bear that in mind as well because there will be byproducts from your co-product utilization process. Um, and then do you decide on a biorefinery approach to generate a number of ingredients from the one co-product resource? Um, and if so, what type of markets do you have for these type of products? And of course, you also have to always consider your competitors. And as I mentioned, there are competitors in the hydrolysis space in relation to dairy, meat, and indeed other fisheries as well. So the market challenges really, if you're targeting the human functional foods market, they're huge. Um, it's a long process to get something approved for human use. Um, you have to basically have your preclinical and clinical trials and a number of these in line. And then um, you get a claim or a health claim based on the evidence that you compile, usually in a dossier that's submitted to the relevant authority in countries such as Canada, the US, EMA or Europe, China or Japan. Okay, and then that can be approved or rejected and it's a timely process and a costly process. For the, we decided in our mini projects here, not mini projects, but our projects to basically look at the pet sector because um, before you go to human studies, you usually have a, a clinic or a non a clinical study and animals can be used as your in vivo tests okay and dogs can often be used for that purpose so if you're making a pet feed ingredient or um, a value-added health ingredient for a pet um, the governing bodies are Fediac and Anfaco and uh, uh, and FACO are based in the US and Fediac are, are the European controllers okay and there are different um, standards that you have to comply with um, and these can be sought out and looked into on the FEDIAC and AAFCO uh, websites. But there's also many opportunities in this area in terms of human functional food use. Um, the market has surpassed 92 billion euros in 2021. And there are, I just show here uh, different products that already exist on the market um, that are making claims regarding heart health, or they're making claims regarding um, anti-inflammatory activity or joint and skin health uh, claims. And the different producers are shown in column three, and then the, the product format and the source material are in columns four and five. 
So if you're interested in any of the first three projects that I mentioned today, uh, BIM have uh, the report that we generated here at Chagask um, in relation to these projects. And I've also given you here a number of the reference papers that we've developed. So I'd like to thank you all very much for your attention and also to acknowledge our funders and the people that we worked with in the different agencies, my own colleagues here in Chagas Ashton, and of course the industry because we couldn't have done any of this work without them. Thank you very much. Great, um, thanks so William Maria for that really interesting presentation. Um, and before we dive into the questions, um, I'd just like to remind people that they can rename themselves as there was an issue with the link so you all seem to have my name or uh, some of you anyway. So if you look at your icon and there's three dots and at the bottom of um, that selection, there's a rename option there. So before we get into the Q&A, Maria, I have one question for you myself. Um, in terms of, I suppose, the, the, the use of co-products for nutrition and for functional or, nutri or nutraceutical benefits, um, is the food ingredient food and ingredient sector open to the utilization of fishery co-products or what do you see as the main challenges to overcome the introduction of fishery co-products to um, the main mainstream ingredients sector? Yeah, I think they're definitely open to using co-products from fisheries. Um, there are some companies already uh, generating products um, for business to business sales and um, in fact, the recent categorization of animal byproducts for um, fuel use, I don't know if you saw that, is a major blow to, to kind of um, pet food manufacturers because it means that the price of, of ingredients they use is going to increase. So um, yeah, they are open to it would be my response. And the major challenges, I suppose, around utilization of co-products would be, in my opinion, the safety of the co-product is paramount you know, um, and the stability, stabilizing the ingredient is also important because you need to have a shelf life for a lot of the products that they generate in the, the pet feed sector. So mm -hmm. that would be my opinion on, on that, Cleana. Okay, great. Um, and we have one here in the Q&A. Um, so a pleasure listening to you, Maria, and the work of Tagusk. I'm wondering, does Tagusk have a database of their IP that companies can buy the rights of or get permission to use? I'm working with a few pet food companies at the moment, and I could see a lot of potential collaboration. Okay. Yeah, thanks very much for your question. Uh, I'm not sure who it's from, but thank you. Um, uh, yes, there are Chagas Technology Office uh, usually deal with queries if people are interested in taking up intellectual property or like if you're interested in anything that I've mentioned today, give me a shout uh, on, via email. I think it will be circulated at the end of this project or at the end of this session and um, I'd be happy to put you in touch with them. Okay. Great. Um, we don't seem to have any more questions. And in terms of time wise, um, we're coming in to the end of Maria's session. So um, thank you very much again.